Joining us here in Washington to talk about the social media war is the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs, PJ Crowley, and from Johannesburg, a media advisor and the former head of online for Al Jazeera English, Mohammed Nanamai. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Mohammed, let me start with you. We heard there in Jim's report about these raw and powerful gripping images that we are seeing on social media sites. How is social media changing the world's view of what is taking place in Gaza right now? Well, I think what's, you know, what's happened, and particularly in Gaza this time, is we've suddenly seen um, these images put the observer um, sitting anywhere in the world directly into the line of fire. You know, people are sitting here and they're immersed in this war. They're immersed in these bombings. You know, we've seen time and space being compressed. And, you know, you could be sitting at home or you could be sitting on your mobile phone and you're going to get images coming out of the Israeli bombing of Gaza instantaneously, just as they happen uh, within minutes, you're looking at them on your phone. And I think that's been quite the game changer um, as far as this event goes. PJ, if it's a game changer, does it work on the side of, say, Hamas here? Because, you know, we talk about asymmetric war, you know, with a big state player fighting against a non-state player here. So does social, help, uh, social media rather help the, the non-state player get his or her message out? Certainly. Uh, you know, clearly this is, this is a province that used to be uh, exclusively to governments. Now you have a, a conflict that is between a government and, and a non-state actor. Uh, so, it, you know, it, and it's the immediacy and the imagery that I think is, is primarily different. That said, given the nature of social media, that we, we tend to select the sources of information that we expose ourselves to and that we trust, and, and you know, the, the, it, it could well be that social media does not necessarily make the conflict easier to resolve, it actually could result in, in reinforcing existing points of view, and that might, in fact, because of the a power of public opinion make this conflict harder to resolve. Right. Attitudes will harden when people see these images. Uh, Mohammed, you know, traditional reporting, as we know, uh, from major news organizations, you worked for Al Jazeera English, we look at CNN, we look at the BBC, etc. They go through a kind of filtering process. You know, we get the raw information that comes in, it's edited, we look for uh, matters of taste, uh, we look for putting things into context, etc. When it comes to social media, however, we don't have any of those filters. So is there a danger here that we do get a distorted picture of what is happening? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's actually been quite refreshing to see the voices coming out from the ground directly. I mean, one of the, um, you know, hallmarks of great journalism has always been journalism was on the ground. When our reporters, whether they were in Vietnam or anywhere else, when journalists put their boots on the ground, got their cameras on the ground, it went into conflict zones, and they were able to you know, tell stories that governments didn't want told. Um, and this has existed before social media, and the great news organizations would do that. You know, journalists would go in to harm's way at many times at, personal risk to the, at great personal risk to themselves in order to tell a story. Um, and if you look at sort of, you know, just in the Middle East, and you take the continuum of events, if we go back to the first Gulf War, um, when CNN started broadcasting, and it was sort of the CNN moment. And if you, you know, remember back then, we saw these uh, magnificent missiles take off um, you know, fired by the Americans, and it, it looked like great fireworks, you know, um, taking off, you know, in night, vision, uh, in night vision cameras. And you'd see them, you know, going out, and this was CNN's moment. But then we fast forward to the second Gulf War, and suddenly when Al Jazeera was broadcasting, you suddenly saw where those missiles landed. Um, and that changed the face of how we perceive the war, because suddenly you saw not just the fireworks, you know, but you saw the resultant destruction. Um, and you saw what effect um, these missiles had. And now when we fast forward to what's happening in Gaza, suddenly you're immersed in this and you're seeing each and every one of the uh, Israeli artillery rounds um, of the rockets landing. And at the same time, you're also seeing the Hamas rockets landing in Israel. And, you know, of course, they're quite <coughs> they've shown to be quite ineffective. Um, but by removing the filter, you know, you no longer give governments or newsrooms the ability to shape a message. And I think this has been quite powerful because you've seen journalists from trusted news organizations, the, one you the ones you've mentioned, CNN, the BBC, um, Sky News, The Guardian, The Independent, The New York Times, having journalists, correspondents on the ground reporting what they're seeing. Um, you know, and suddenly, you know, the public gets a view to this war, and it's no longer the shaped message that's serving some political interest. All right. PJ, if we look at this propaganda war as a conflict, who's winning this propaganda war, especially with, uh, in, in this conflict in Gaza right now? Well, I don't think anyone's winning. Um, the costs are mounting on both sides. 
Uh, but he, he raises a very, very good point. If you went back to the Gulf War in 1991, um, the battlefield was defined, it was controlled. Now we've seen in conflicts since, um, the, a, a number of things. For example, if you go to the early stages of the civil war in Syria, you know, the mainstream media was not there. Uh, and so we were relying on citizen journalists you know, to, to help understand the dynamic of the conflict in its early stages. The dilemma there, though, is that you don't necessarily have you know, trusted sources. You also have a, a situation where you can have social media and, it ha it, 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 and traditional media, and there's an intersection there. You know, in, in the dynamic of the Tahrir Square, for example, it wasn't that one was necessarily decisive, it was the accounts in the square at Tahrir reinforced you know, by the coverage of Al Jazeera and others that created this power that forced the Mubarak government and others you know, <coughs> to, uh, to respond. Uh, Mohammed Nadabai, um, when we look at the media war, the social media war that's being fought uh, in cyberspace, has it worked to the advantage of the Palestinians in this particular conflict? I think it, you know, I, I don't think the Palestinians have any advantage, advantage in this particular conflict. I think the, <coughs> the battle has been so one-sided. You know, if you look at the might of the military, um, the Israeli military versus, you know, the people of Gaza. And I think, you know, that's quite important to how this conflict gets framed. Because often we talk about whether Hamas or whether Israel's winning, whether it's the media war or the physical war. And I think the reality that we've seen coming from Gaza, it's, you know, there's not the symmetrical conflict. You know, the, the, the attack by the Israelis in this, um, at this particular time is on the people of Gaza. And I think, you know, when we, when, we, when we frame it as such, you know, what actually emerges is, you know, neither side are winning. You know, the Israelis are clearly losing the narrative. It's gone beyond their hands. Um, you're seeing protests across the world. You're seeing celebrities suddenly tweeting about uh, what's happening in Gaza, something that was unheard of previously. Um, and, you know, in a way, you know, as a journalist, you sit back and you say, well, you know, we might think the truth is actually winning. Um, and I think that's quite profound. Okay. PJ. Is there any evidence to tell us that all this media that is floating around in cyberspace is changing public opinion, say, in the United States about what is going on there? Well, certainly um, it, it, it will have an impact in terms of public opinion. It will have impact in terms of, of uh, perceptions when this conflict ends uh, of who gained, who lost, at what cost. And uh, as we're seeing, we're seeing profound costs on both sides. In terms of how transformative this will be, that remains to be seen because ultimately underneath this conflict, uh, there are narratives and there are competing narratives involved in this, but this is really about str the strategic interest of Hamas and the strategic interest of Israel. You know, H Hamas wants to break the siege of Gaza. Uh, Israel wants to reestablish uh, a quiet and, and stop the rockets from flowing. You know, so how, you know, th this public opinion will continue to mount over time and that will ultimately force a ceasefire on both sides. But right now, despite all of this information, the graphic, uh, you know, pictures, you know, the use of social media, actually, when you have to look, when you look at it, you know, this is following the same path that we've seen in previous uh, conflicts between Hamas and Israel. And I'm not right. sure it necessarily has that uh, profound transformative effect. Okay, we're gonna have to leave it there. Thanks for joining us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. And while the battle continues in Gaza, we'll leave you with some compelling images of the mounting human toll. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, DC. Thanks for watching.